Hey, thanks for coming back today on this uh, little episode. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, another American side-by-side -side shotgun. Uh, we've talked about L.C. Smith in the past, uh, but this is one that probably, if you didn't have one, maybe your father or grandfather or somebody in the family probably had a version of this gun. This is a Stevens Model 311 side-by-side uh, -side shotgun. And it's probably the most heavily produced, I'd, I'd have to double check this, but I believe it is probably the most heavily produced American-made side-by-side -side in history. It's no longer in production now, but several million were made under various names, both um, under the Stevens name made by Savage and then made for various uh, big box and hardware uh, slash catalog stores for many years. Uh, and there's tons of them still in production today. This is one we picked up lately uh, as a trade-in at the range. And it's just a solid, very usable shotgun. There's bunches of them in use today. So let's take a look at, at kind of where they came from. And it gives us the opportunity to discuss how Stevens and Savage uh, all interrelated and came to be. They started out very much as separate companies, and Stevens is actually the older of the two. Stevens actually started in Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts back in the mid-1860s, around 1864. And um, they, the Stevens Arms Company, uh, is Stephen J. Stevens Arms and Tool. You can kind of date those by how by how the older Stephen guns are marked. Uh, but they originated the 22 rimfire, 22 long rifle round. So they're kind of credited for the invention of of that round. And they were making uh, rifles, uh, single shot rifles and single shot pistols, chambering that 22 long rifle round. So. Uh, they were a pretty significant producer of shotguns and uh, rimfire rifles uh, up until uh, right at 1920. Uh, in 1920, they were purchased by Savage. And Savage Arms uh, had been founded, uh, I've got to refer to my notes because all these dates run into my oatmeal brain, but uh, 1894, Savage Arms in Utica, New York, uh, and then uh, they eventually moved to Westfield, Massachusetts, where they are now, but uh, they were a significant producer of rifles and, and sporting firearms uh, from, from their introduction, and then um, during the World War I era, they were uh, acquired by or taken over by Westinghouse, and they were producing a lot of war material, but they came out of World War I uh, as a pretty strong entity, and they actually acquired Stevens in um, 1920. And that kind of solidified them as one of the biggest uh, sporting arms manufacturers, sporting firearm manufacturers in the United States, certainly. And they stayed strong enough through the 20s that they actually purchased, uh, made two other great acquisitions in 1929. They acquired the Crescent Davis Firearms Company, which was a significant manufacturer of side-by-side -side shotguns. And they also acquired A.H. Uh, Fox, uh, which was a producer of side-by-side -side shotguns on a par with L.C. Smith and Parker. So uh, they really solidified their position in, uh, in throughout the 20s with uh, the acquisition of some major uh, U.S. brands and, and really put them among the top tier of sporting arms producers in the United States at that time. So um, during that time, uh, Stevens was producing side-by-side uh, -side shotguns. They were all box lock shotguns like this. There, there, were, there were no side locks, but uh, of, of various styles, various internal styles. Some of the technology uh, was brought over from Crescent Davis, and then some was uh, adapted from some of the earlier Stevens designs. But what became the Stevens 311 or the Savage 311 uh, really originated about 1920 with that Savage Stevens uh, merger or buyout. So uh, when they did that, when Savage acquired Stevens, it gave them, gave them the, the ability to have a little bit of brand separation, if you will. So they used the Stevens name on the more utilitarian uh, hardware store, uh, catalog 
type guns, and they retain that Savage name, and then, uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, the Fox name even, uh, for the, the higher end or the, the I don't want to say higher quality guns because the actions are identical. The actions are the same. The wood changes and the, and the embellishment change. But it, it gave them the ability to have some brand separation and price point separation between those guns. So it was a pretty, pretty astute move on Savage's part to do that. So uh, in 1920 or in the early 20s, we start seeing this basic box lock action. Uh, and with uh, with a marking of, of 5,000, a model 5,000 on it. You'll see that also using the Springfield brand name. And there, there's some confusion there because we have people, uh, I mean, fairly regularly think they have a Springfield Armory 12-gauge shotgun, and, and they don't. It's not Springfield Armory. Uh, Springfield Armory, the one we know today, is relatively recent. It has nothing to do with the Springfield Armory, the U.S. Armory, from um, the 1800s, so, but that's, that's a whole other story. The uh, Springfield was a brand name, and you'll see that on these guns also. Uh, that was used on a hardware store and, and chain store type gun contracts. But uh, you'll see a Mark 5000, and you'll see a Mark 5100. I think the 5100s are around 1931. And then around 1940, that all coalesced into the Stevens 311. And then as there were further changes or further design changes or features changed, then we have series. Uh, you'll see the 311 Series A, Series B, Series C, and so forth. And in fact, I think this one, yeah, 311 Series H. So this is, this is definitely a later gun. Uh, and these can be somewhat hard to date, um, depending, on, depending on the era and when they were made. So if it has a serial number, it's post-1968. Uh, the Gun Control Act of 68 required these guns to be serialized. Prior to that uh, law going into effect, shotguns and rimfire rifles that were made domestically in the United States were not required to be serialized. And some manufacturers didn't. I mean, a lot of manufacturers did not. Remington, uh, there was a lot of Remington 22s not serialized. Winchester 22s not serialized. And these... Savage Stevens 311s before 1968, not serialized. But <coughs> what they did have uh, from 1949 until 1968, there was a code. And this is a post-68 gun, so it doesn't have the date code that I'm about to talk about. But where you would find that date code, there would be a small oval about a quarter of an inch in diameter, typically right here, on the bottom of the frame, about level with the, with the hinge pin, there would be a small oval with a number and a letter, sometimes a, a two-digit number and a letter, and in very, very small, very, very small stamp. Uh, I have to look at it w under magnification to even see it, to be honest with you, but uh, the letters what count. Uh, 1949 corresponded to A, and that chart's available on the internet. You can find it in various sources. If you just Google Savage Stevens date codes, there'll be a chart that comes up with those letters cor corresponding to the years between 48 and uh, between 49 and 68. So uh, that's one good way to date the guns in that uh, during that time frame. Otherwise, you have to look at how the receivers marked uh, on the guns that aren't serialized. So. And even the guns that are serialized, I mean, you may be able to call Savage, but uh, the older Stevens, uh, Savage, the records just don't exist anymore. And I've heard that there was a sprinkler, fire sprinkler incident, or, or whatever the issue is. Um, Savage doesn't really have any information on these older Stevens Mark 311s, uh, date-wise, any longer. So um, you have to go with sometimes the 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 location stamped on the receiver it's a Utica Mart receiver it's Chicopee Falls is at Westfield Massachusetts and then look at when the company changed uh, those locations and give you a roundabout date of when that uh, when that gun was manufactured so let's talk about the features of the particular gun and then some of the things you might see on them when you're um, when you encounter one that's being offered for sale at a gun show or or wherever so it's a box lock action meaning the, the, uh, the hammers and, and all the materials enclosed within this receiver. There are no removable side plates uh, at all. So everything is, is in here 
And um, then we have obviously the stock. Now the stocks on most of these guns are gonna be uh, hardwood with a walnut stain. They'll be birch or there'll be some type of uh, American hardwood uh, material with a walnut stain. Now we, we said that Savage used uh, the, the Fox uh, name and they did on a variant of this gun, same action, but it was uh, the Savage Fox and then Fox Model B, Fox BS, Fox BSE for ejectors. And those would be walnut stock guns, a little bit higher refinement to the exterior finish of the guns. But for the most part, these guns are hardwood stock with a walnut stain. Now, uh, the earlier guns, this was not straight. The receiver has an indent. There's an indent on the side here, so they come in. Uh, it's like a Type 1 and a Type 2 stock, if you will. So uh, if you're looking for wood, for the for these stocks, it's it's being remade. Uh, there are a lot of people cutting stocks, uh, a lot of stock manufacturers that cut stocks for the 311s, and you'll just need to recognize that there are two styles of stock, basically the ones with the cutout here on the receiver and the ones that are straight. There are different frame sizes: the 12 gauge, the 20 gauge, and then the 410 size frame. Well, the 410 and the 20 gauge frame, I believe, are similar. So the 12 gauge frame is different. The gun was produced in 12, 16, 20 gauges and 410. I've never seen one or known of one in 28 gauge. Uh, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, I just don't know about it. And uh, for a fact, they were never produced in 10 gauge. Um, there's not one in three and a half inch chamber in 12 gauge, they're all three inch. Uh, well, once the three inch guns were introduced, the earlier Stevens guns might be shorter chambered than that. From uh, about 1940 uh, till about 1950, so into 1951, uh, there was a different stock material used on some cases on not just the 311, but other models of the Savage Stevens line, like the Model 94 uh, single shot shotgun or the 124 manually operated repeater shotgun. It was a material called Tenite, T-E-N-I-T-E, -E, uh, which was, for lack of a better term, a type of plastic. So you'll see that, and it had a strange looking uh, modeled finish uh, and some impressed checkering in it. But the Tenite stocks uh, were, were made during that time, 1940 through about 1950, 1951. And occasionally we'll get the Savage guns in with Tenite stocks and there's been some failure of the Tenite stocks uh, and they want to replace it with wood. And it, that's not necessarily just a simple find the stock and replace it. The, the draw bolt for the butt stock is different. There, there may be some other changes that have to be made. We can do it or, or any decent gunsmith can do it, uh, but it's, it's not just a plug and play type thing in most cases. So they weren't factory equipped with pads. Uh, at least I've not seen one factory equipped with pads. They typically had a, just a plastic uh, butt plate on there. There's a simple draw bolt that comes through here to attach the, I believe it's quarter 20 thread that, that attaches the buttstock to the back of the receiver. Double triggers are typical on these guns. Uh, under the Savage Fox name, uh, they did introduce a single trigger version of this gun. I've not seen a 311 with a single trigger. They're all the double trigger. Uh, and you could get just about any uh, choke combination you wanted as long as it was either full and full or full and modified. Uh, the 12 gauge guns and 30 inch are almost always full and full, although they can be full modified. The 28 inch guns like this and, and uh, 12 and 20, this is a 20 gauge, are, I've not seen one other than full and modified. Um, that said, uh, you know, back, back in the day, we, we could actually modify these chokes or open them up, and we could open them up to improve cylinder fairly easily if, you know, if someone wanted to do that. Uh, choke tubes can be installed in these guns, uh, but bear in mind you're going to pay twice the price of a single barrel, right? Uh, so that can be done as well. So, I mean, they're still very usable guns. I've not seen one marked with a choke designation. Most of the time you have to measure the, the muzzles to find out what the choke designation is. So, super utilitarian guns, let's pop it apart real quick uh, and kind of take a look at some of the other stuff that goes on with these. So. Simple lever here opens up extractors, not ejectors, uh, on the 311s. Again, the Fox um, series or Fox Model B, if it ends with an E, 
uh, that would stand for ejectors. The Series E, the 311E, does not stand for ejectors on the 311. So there's no latch. This screw does not do anything to take the gun apart. It's just a simple grab it here and pull it up. If you notice, you have a little recess here so you can get a hold of it and pull it up. It's, it's tensioned onto the barrel set uh, with this heavy spring here. So then it's just a matter of opening the gun up and pull it apart. So we can look at some of the markings on the gun. And, and this confuses a lot of people when we talked about, when we talked about that date code, the little oval here, uh, and then they see numbers, and sometimes the numbers are in a circle here on the, the barrel flats or on the water table of the receiver. And that's not the date code. Uh, these are assembly marks um, used during the manufacturing process to make sure that pieces that were mated together stayed mated together uh, throughout. So that's what that is, not the date code. The date code is always going to be external. You may find it in a different place than what I've shown you, although typically that's where you're going to find it on the 311. So uh, keep that in mind and don't get confused by these numbers here. They're relatively meaningless as to when the firearm was made. So this particular gun is a, a post-68 gun, like we said, because we have a serial number here on the side. But let's take a little bit of, of thought about, let me put this up here in the light so you can see the, the finish that's on the side of that receiver. And it's designed to look like case hardening, but it is not uh, case hardening. It's not color case hardening, which is a bone charcoal heat quench process. This process was actually done with uh, cyanide. So it's a, it's a cyanide-based staining, for lack of a better term, uh, on, that, on that metal there of the receiver. So uh, that process is not, to my knowledge, not being replicated today um, because of the dangers of producing that finish. So a good way to judge the overall use and condition of a 311 is how much of that original cyanide faux case color still remains on the gun. So uh, the higher, the, the more the finish exists, the higher condition. And typically, if it's got a lot of, of this finish, it's still got a lot of factory blue here. So uh, that's kind of what you're looking for condition-wise. So we have a simple safety here, up-down safety. Cocking the gun rod pushes the safety back. You have to bring the safety back forward to fire once you close the gun and the, and the lever comes across. So these pins here on the side are directional pins. Uh, they're the same diameter, but they're splined on one side, which means they have grooves on the pin that anchor it into place inside of the receiver. So uh, a, a good way to tell if somebody's been in the gun for some reason is the splines are not on the correct side or the splines are opposite sides of each other. Or you can see where someone has been trying to hammer the pin out the wrong way and there's little dents around the pinhole from where they've been trying to uh, to bring pins out so uh, why would they the question then becomes why are you trying to take the pins out of that gun uh, and typically what we see on the 311s is uh, a hammer not cocking and usually that's because of either the, the sear spring there are two sears that run along that are indexed off of this pin here, and there's a wire spring that powers each of them on either side that operate off this trigger. So um, either the sear spring fails or the tip of the sear that engages the notch and the hammer fails, and that sear has to be replaced. And, and the good news is there's enough of these guns made that those parts are available. And I always caution people about buying used parts because the part that you get um, may be worse than the part that you've got, that you already have. So just be cautious of that. There are parts being remade for these guns, which is uh, good news, because if you get the opportunity to use a, uh, a newer part, obviously you should always do that. So uh, replacing the hammer springs, the hammer spring on this gun, hammer index is off this pin, but the hammer spring are enormous. Uh, they're really heavy springs. They live in a blind hole going that way, and they push the bottom of the hammer toward the back of the gun and rotates the hammer forward to hit the firing pin. So 
Um, replacing that is typically not a DIY process because you have to compress that uh, hammer spring with the hammer in order to get the pin through. And the method that we use involves a long tapered pin to go through there, index that, and it's just a process because also through here, you also have to, to index the cocking lever between the two hammers when you come through with this pin. So if um, my suggestion is, unless you have a, a fairly decent gunsmithing setup and a little bit of knowledge about how this gun works, if you start to have failure to fire on the gun, take the gun to a gunsmith familiar with the 311s, uh, with the Savage Series guns. And this is a job that you're probably best off having uh, the professional do. Just, and my opinion, uh, by all means, I'm not solicitating you send me these guns. Uh, I don't particularly enjoy working on them, but, uh, but we can get it done. What, what you're seeing here in the center, that's that cocking lever. And when that engages here, and when you rotate the barrel down, that rotates, that in turn brings that up and that pushes the two hammers back. Is the, the whole theory about the whole gun is very, very simple, really. Uh, but the parts are sturdy, the parts are big, the parts are heavy, and uh, it, it's not that easy of a gun to take apart. So these guns were produced up until about 1989. So it, it's a very long run, 1920-ish to 1989, except some 69 years, 69, 70 years. So there are millions of them produced, and uh, there is a lot still out there and there are a lot uh, available on the collector's market. So to my knowledge, Savage did not produce a short-barreled version of this gun. Uh, we see a lot of 20-inch guns. We see a lot of 18-inch guns. Uh, I believe virtually all of those have been cut down uh, by owners or gunsmiths at some point. And we've done quite a few. We've, we've actually made quite a few 18 and a half inch guns. And uh, the way we do that is obviously measuring from here. We'll cut it, uh, and yes, you can do it with a hacksaw. It'd be greater, better if you do it with a, a bandsaw to give you a straighter cut. Then we face each barrel individually. And, but that's going to leave this rib, although the ribs are hard soldered, uh, both the, the bottom rib and the top rib are hard soldered between the barrels and the barrels themselves are soldered together. But once you cut that, you can see that plug between the two barrels at the muzzle. So it, the rib is hollow between the barrels. That's a plug in the end of the muzzle. So once you cut that down, there's a gap there. So um, this is uh, lead, uh, typically, that is uh, inset here from the factory. We'll use acroglass dyed black or something along that line to plug that to plug that flush again wherever we cut it at, and then reset uh, reset this bead, which is a pretty simple process. So, all in all, that's a fairly simple process to shorten one. Um, and the good news is these guns are not terribly expensive. They're not heavily collected. Uh, the, the Fox version of this gun, um, not to be confused with Ansley Fox or even the Fox Sterlingworth, Savage did make the, the Sterlingworth Fox, true Fox Sterlingworth for a number of years after they acquired the Fox name, but then it became the Fox Model B, BSE uh, in the 60s and 70s at that point. So um, they can get a little bit expensive. So what would you be looking to pay for a typical Stevens 311, and it's a utilitarian gun, but it's still a sought-after gun. So in 12 gauge, which the majority of them are, in decent shape, you're probably going to pay in that 400-ish dollar range, you know, 350, 400 dollar range, um, for a, a good, serviceable, decent condition, nice amount of color left here, uh, no big gouges, that type of stuff. Uh, as the bore diameter gets smaller, the price goes up a little bit. The 2016 20 gauge guns are on about the same money. You can add about $100 for that. Uh, and the 410 bore guns um, typically bring in that five to $600 range. We see people asking more for them uh, quite often. I don't know if they get them or not, uh, if they get that money or not, but more power to them, I guess, if they do. 
So when you go to evaluate one, we've already talked about some of the conditions, but what can go wrong with them? Uh, we talked about the sear tips already. Pay attention to the trigger guard. It's a stamped steel piece. Uh, it can get bent, and when it, when it gets bent, it can crimp up on these triggers and not allow you to pull a trigger all the way to the rear. Uh, these parts all interchange between all gauges, so these, these are being remade and, uh, and can be sourced fairly easily. The other thing that goes wrong is this uh, attachment piece right here. So, as we said, this, this uh, screw, the only screw thing this screw does is hold the front of the foreign iron uh, onto the wood. Then you have another screw here. Re removing those screws will pull that out. So, you have this heavy spring here, but there's a small wire spring under that one that gives it that spring tension to come up. And it's actually called the four end spring spring. For, I mean, uh, they certainly weren't very imaginative about what to call that, but really what else would you call it, I guess. But So that thing can go bad and we don't have adequate tension on this spring here. So when that happens, it becomes difficult to get this spring when you're assembling it, you have to get that spring in that notch. So let's, let's see if I can, let's see if I can do that. To reattach the gun, we come in here, that closes, see that, that would be off to the fire position, or you can move it back to the safe position. As we come in here with the forend, we want to get this forend spring in that notch right there. We want it to get in, into that uh, feature there on that lug on the barrel set. And then it's just a matter of having everything in line and compressing it in. So what we find happens is if it's, if it's not completely in line and somebody goes to just gorilla grip that thing closed, they'll snap something in here the, or the, the wood will crack or something along that nature. So pay attention to that. Make sure that when you're looking at the Stevens, the foreign doesn't just flop off, which would give you um, an indication that that foreign spring spring is bad. This is all repairable. Uh, the parts are, are out there to do, to do that. So good utilitarian shotgun if you like side-by-sides and i enjoy hunting with side-by-sides this is a great uh, a great little gun uh, for be not just beginners but people that just enjoy the the classic hunting vibe if you will of, of hunting with a side-by-side -side shotgun without spending a truckload of money on a lc smith or a parker or anything of that nature. These are good utilitarian shotguns. They do kick, uh, in my experience. I remember as a kid, uh, a friend of ours had a 10 inch stocked 12 gauge, and it got to where if you didn't flinch before you started shooting that gun, you, you learned how to flinch after shooting it. So um, I look for them, you know, if I'm, if I'm out and about and I just get to go into some random pawn shop, I always look for the 311s up there to see if there's one that, that I can get for a, a decent price because they're a good quality gun to have. So the Stevens 311, a little bit of the history, a little bit of what to look for. Uh, if you like the content that we're doing, please uh, hit that subscribe button, drop a comment um, on, uh, on what you're seeing. Uh, if you have a make or model that you want us to take a look at, by all means, uh, drop that in the comments too. We look at all that stuff and we, we try to source it and get it on the video for us. Look at the other videos and appreciate your attention and have a good day.